Thank you very much. I'm really pleased that this is the first time I've been speaking in public since March <laughs> 2020. And teaching this particular subject is one of my favorite things to do. Um, so let me let me start a little bit by telling you how I got into estate planning as opposed to any other number of fields. Um, I was in law school during the AIDS crisis in San Francisco, and our church, at that time we were going to Calvary Presbyterian, now we go to Westminster, um, had a special group of deacons, which is the way we're organized, who were providing care for our uh, members who were suffering with AIDS and their survivors. So I got involved doing deathbed work um, with people because what was happening in those days, even for couples who lived together for decades, a partner would die. There were no legal protections. The family, which was often estranged, would show up. They would throw the partner out of the house, take the body and all of the possessions. And this happened again and again. And it was heartbreaking. And I learned, um, maybe because I'm a farm girl, I can do death work. And secondly, that the law can make a positive difference in people's lives. This kind of law. So that's kind of how I did it. I want to tell you how to structure this. Um, they are recording this for Zoom for your archives. So if you have a question, especially if it's a personal type question, please wait till the end when we turn on the camera. Okay? If you have a question like, what does that word mean if I've forgotten to find something? Raise your hand. Happy to do that. I want to make sure we're all going along the same way. There are a couple of things on your chairs. There's sort of an outline. Some of this we'll get to, and who knows where this might go. Okay. And the other is a list of resources that I updated, which is good because a lot of things have changed. Um, and on the back are a list of reading that you might want to do in your families or maybe in small groups. I know you've all recently, or many of you recently finished, I'm going to walk over here just a second. Um, Katie Butler's The Art of Dying Well which is excellent, really excellent. But there's some others. I'm also sure many of you have read it's called The Laundry's Being Mortal. But there are a couple of others that didn't get as much press. One is Modern Death by a doctor. This is a beautiful book, both uh, technically explaining physical processes and disease, but also emotional and social connected to to the end of life and why our health system doesn't deal well with the end of life. Beautiful book. Um, one of my great teachers in life was a woman named Negri Anderson. Did any of you know her? She did sacred dying, she did workshops, she trained hospice workers, and she trained deaf healers. Someone to walk along someone. It's a you approach the death as a transition as important as birth. And we shouldn't just leave it a chance or, right? It's a beautiful book. Um, this is a memoir. There's a lot of deaf memoirs. This one I love. It's by a physician who's a uh, brain surgeon. He developed brain cancer, the irony. Um, and he wrote this while he was dying. And it is gorgeous. He was 41 years old. But it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And then two others. I like them here so you can take a look at them before you walk on or check them out of the library. This is old Ethical Wills, the second edition. This was done in the first one was done in the 80s. Okay, we'll talk about that. And then Barbara Coombs Lee is an attorney, a minister, you name it. She's done a nurse. Uh, she was with Compassion and Choices, and she was a major force. For the dying community legislation here and in Oregon and several other states. This is a tough read, but it's really useful. Particularly if you have older parents, this is really helpful. Up here, I also have two different documents. It depends if you're single or coupled. So, one of the things I think is so important, and believe me, I haven't finished doing all this stuff myself, just so you know. Is that somewhere in your house you have an ice folder in case of emergency? 
and your family knows where it is. Okay. Now, I'll, I always do this to clients and tell them to do this, and they come back in after someone dies and it's full of scraps of paper and stuff. That's fine. It doesn't have to be beautifully done, it doesn't have to be full touch. But someplace where someone grabbed this, particularly if you don't have family nearby, someone knows who your minister is, right? Someone knows where you keep things. Someone knows who your CPA is, just as a thought. So something right. And there are two different forms. Um, the basic of getting our affairs in order, 10 things my family needs to know. And so there's a list, literally 10 things, and the attachments that you might want to put together, either in this folder or if you're a binder person, you could do it on PDF. My near sister, which is in the South, that's the best friend who should have been a sister, but wasn't. Um, all of this is uploaded to a, a data vault, and I have the access. Right? So these are here for you. I just didn't put them on your chairs, so I didn't know what the status was. And then I dug in my closet, and I have 15 copies of slide dishes. You're welcome to take one. Um, they're also on the resource sheet. You can get them online. So those are kind of our supplies. And then I wanted to mention a couple of other things that might be helpful in your, if you do small group around this. One is the go wish game. People use this to discuss end of life choices, advance the care plan. It's made in Canada, but you can get it like everything else on Amazon. And this is something called um, life legacy cards. Okay. It's made by Personal Legacy Advisors LLC. Again, you can get them online. And they also, for small group work, they make big ones, like eight by eight, right? So they're things like, it's supposed to lead to a trigger discussion. For example, here's a set called, picture the legacy you would like to create. Tell a story of a high point in your life. Describe a place you love. And you're thinking, well, what does that have to do with your life? Well, what you're trying to get in touch with are the values and priorities that make your life meaningful. Okay. I work with lots and lots of older people. And they'll come in and we'll have a discussion about end of life. And we'll do um, documents that basically say no extraordinary efforts. No mechanical ventilation, no tube feeding, right? Okay. My file will go on a decade, she'll come back in. She's 97 now. And her great granddaughter's getting married next June. We took all that out. She wants to be alive to see her great granddaughter. She said, Now, the day after the wedding, I'm coming back. We're getting all of this out of here. What I'm saying is, depending on what's meaningful, what we're willing to endure to have those experiences shifts over time. It can shift from year to year. It can shift from diagnosis to diagnosis. So this is, a, is not a once and done process. Okay. That's kind of my preliminary stuff. So one of the things that I noticed most, this was 2019. I got a call from a woman's daughter. She was in Florida. Her mother was in Nevada taking care of her mother's brother who was dying and did die. Um, and she said, you've got to help my mom. She's losing her mind, right? This, this, she didn't even know her brother was sick. She shows up and he's dying. And so I go out there and I meet with this woman. And this is right after her brother was gone. And in the midst of all this, he had done a California statutory will. And so on your materials, there's a reference to the Sacramento Law Library. And they will let you download statutory things. I guess what I'm saying is please don't pay legal to for things that you are entitled to for free. Please. Okay. So there's an advanced health care directive, very simple. Kaiser has one, Southern Health has one, everyone has one, but this is the basic. They also have 
the uniform statutory form power of attorney for finances. This is if you have retirement accounts, life insurance, tax deferred annuities. These are uh, assets that go like beneficiary. You've named your beneficiaries in a form. This lets someone go talk to those companies. Also talk to the IRS if you're not able to. This is a free form available online from the Sacramento Public Law Library. And this is the California statutory bill. I'm going to put them up here so you can look at them afterwards, see what they look like. So there's that you know, description, and it looks like this. And you can fill it out online as a PDF bill. So this man, as sick as he was, did this before his sister came. And we probated as a stage. It's never an easy thing, but at least we had a way to do it. And she had all the authority she needed, right? To clear his apartment and sell it. And to, it was just brilliant. It was such an act of love in the middle of feeling really crummy that he took the time. Right? So there are resources, there are free resources. Uh, Noah Press has a book called Every Californian's Guide to Estate Planning, which is really good. So I don't put anyone on the spot, but if you have an estate plan that you haven't looked at it in 10 years, are there people here with that situation? This is very common. Um, two things to know, your financial documentation is considered stale by all the financial institutions after eight years maximum. So you always want to update your power of attorney every 80 years. Actually, I may not want to do that Because when your loved ones are trying to deal with the financial institution, they won't talk to them. And they're always looking for a reason not to talk to your loved ones. It's like in their code, right? Unless you're working in a small regional bank, yay, or credit unions, yay, right? Um, so you want to make sure that's up to date. You want to, every couple of years, maybe when you're doing your taxes and you've got all that documentation, you want to make sure that your beneficiaries are who you think they are. So a lot of people named beneficiaries 30 years ago on their life insurance or their pensions. Go double check, make sure they've got it right. For example, if a child has changed your name, Mary, you might want to go and change that information. You just kind of have to think ahead to what's going to be a stumbling block for your family in terms of the finances. The basic documents that every adult, and I mean every adult, needs are the healthcare directive. I think it's probably the most important document. They're, the state of California has a plan for you if you don't do any financial plans. It's called a probate code. Is that? Okay, let the um, um, it is the thing that you have to fill out when you go to the hospital. What's it called? Advanced health record. Right. Does that expire in a certain amount of time, too? Um, I'm doing one right now for a gentleman um, where we're having trouble with the long term care insurance company. So he's been in a long term relationship with a man that he's not married to, which makes it a little more complicated. And the long term care insurance, who I will not name, has refused to allow his partner to trigger the insurance. And so I'm going into an assisted care facility on Monday. I'll be in a hazmat suit, but to sign new documents for him. So, yes. Also, if you have a change in health condition, yeah. right, or a diagnosis, or I'll tell you when people most often come to redo their plan particularly about healthcare, is after they've had experience with someone they love. And you see what happens in the medical system because it varies in one's what kind of treatment people get and how much respect is paid. I have a client now, her brother is uh, severely diabetic in a nursing home. And she went in for surgery herself and left specific instructions that if X happened, he was not transported to more general. That was his wish, her wish, her instructions. They not only transported to more general, but they put four stents in. 
This man has been waiting to die and to release from the suffering. And this has become a huge problem because now this poor man is trapped in a body that has betrayed him. And he feels like his sister didn't protect him. She was in the operating room, right? So yes, I think making sure that your documents accurately reflect what you want. Now, the five wishes has a lot of information that's not actually about healthcare. So if you do that kind of form, please do a statutory form. Because what will actually happen in the hospital is they're going to look for the first page. They're going to look who is authorized as a decision maker. The other information you include is for your family or for the person you've asked to make this decision. My mother had a severe COPD and a heart condition. And at the end of her life, we had a pulse. We said, no, it was not a patient, yes, are all of that stuff. So uh, when we went, so two years before she died, there was a, an emergency. They took her to uh, the hospital, then they transported to Charleston Medical Center. It was about lunch. And before I could get them from the West Coast, and despite my instructions, they put stents in. And my mother didn't want stents because she hoped her heart would take her out before she suffered. Right? So we get to the very end, and she's at home with hospice care, but we can't manage her habitation without the pain, which is not uncommon. Um, and frankly, my brother's not good with anything medical. He has a panic attack if he has to walk across the threshold of the hospital. So I can fly in to my hometown, rent a car, drive down to Charleston, I get in, and have a huge fight for a surgical resident. Don't get me started. Um, but I made sure that I posted her pulse above her bed, on the foot of her bed, in her chart, and taped on her chest. Because, I mean, is that me doing that? Yeah. Don't touch the mic. Was I touching it? Yeah. Anywhere close. Sorry. Sorry about that. So, can you define post? It's a physician's order for life sustaining treatment. It used to be called a DMR. Oh, okay. And California and 17 other states now use the post. This gentleman is going to make me not click at you. Where's the other mic? Oh. Is that all? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Maybe. All right. all right. I was waiting for the screech. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the second document then is the power of attorney for finance. We we'll talked about that again, available online. Um, the third, at a minimum, is a simple will. You can use a statutory will. You can write the will by hand in California. It has to be entirely in your hand. Sign. It doesn't even have to be dated in mm -hmm. California, and it can be unwitnessed. I probated what's called a holographic will. And I probated one of these um, in 2010 in San Francisco. And I had to find people who could testify that they recognized her handwriting. Which we did, you know why? This woman wrote thank you notes. They were so beautiful, people saved them. And so they could produce a handwriting sample to show that this was this woman's. It was very important. It was very, but it was, yes, you could do that, and I have done that, and I've read that. But the problem is often at that point, people are too weak, right? And that's the case if you need two kids, two adults who are not related. To the person, because usually you're leaving things to your family, so you don't want them to be witnessing your signature. It looks a little self interested. And they have to be 18 years old. Okay? I have grabbed people in the parking lot to do this when you need to do it. These are the basics of anyone 18 and over. If you have kids going off to college, you need to get a minimum HIPAA form so that the doctors will talk to you about your child. If they're unable to speak to you. HIPAA in California and federally says that the doctors can't speak to anyone who's not authorized. So if your child is unconscious, you have no right to information 
adoption of child's medical condition. Okay? We call this a young adult plan. We do it for all of our clients. We know all of their children are going to be detained. And it's the first, it's the child's first experience as a legal adult. And we make a big deal out of that. Okay. For most of us, though, if you own your home, um, if you want to provide protection for particularly younger beneficiaries, certainly minors, or even young people in their clients, then you probably would use a revocable trust, which in California is sort of the standard because of the way the probate court is set up. They try really hard, but they're underfunded and understaffed. Right now, the rent for the probate judge is out for nine months. So the people filling in are not probate people. There are other judges filling in. It's going to be new right now. So everyone's rescheduling their stuff until the judge comes back. So there's another nine months on top of 18 months away. So the trust is a, con is a contract. You determine the terms of it. You determine how long it lasts. You provide very detailed instructions about everything from your pet to your grandchildren to your property, and it's private. Unless there's litigation, it's no one's business except you and your beneficiaries ultimately. Okay? And it's no more work than doing a will that would have those kinds of details in it. If you do a trust, then you have a simple will, which is super powerful. It's like four pages long. It says, I have a trust. So if anything's left out, put it back in the trust. Why is that important? Uh, a client died, she was 94. She had done a great job. She had a trust since the 90s. And she had always kept everything really in order, but the last five or six years, right? She wasn't well and so on. And so we kept finding these assets and we didn't know where they were or so on. And it was during the financial crisis, okay? So she had a big account at, um, what was it called? World Savings in Oakland, you remember that? They went down in the savings and loan crisis at about the eighties. So that account then got transferred to Wachovia. I gotta remember this. Then Wachovia to Washington Mutual. Okay, so this is September 2010. Okay, we go into the Washington Mutual office in Fort Madera. There used to be one with the account number from the World Savings account. You know, tracing it through. And her poor over well. And we walked out with a cashier's check for a million dollars without court insurance. It was amazing. So it's very powerful. Now you still have to get a court order, which is probably why all these financial institutions fail, frankly. Right? But my client was relieved because we were going to have to probate that one account. So, in terms of Have you heard of ethical wills? Okay. So it comes from the Jewish tradition. And it's part of uh, Jewish practice that for, as part of an adult, particularly later in life, you explain to your family and loved ones in a letter what's been important to you, what you feel you learned, what you hope to pass on. Um, and there's a lot of material online, as well as uh, Dr. Bain's book, some churches do small groups around this. Thank you for mentioning that because the um, Adult Spiritual Development Committee is going to run two workshops that are led by a rabbi on how to write your ethics. Oh, great. That's fantastic. And there are some. I'm not sure. Excellent. We do this at uh, my church in the city with ethical wills, and we also we have a relationship with the synagogue. Their it's a really interesting experience. I, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have this tradition in other faiths, you know, because I think it's, it's just sort of a point in time where you take stock and think about your life and think about who you are and what you're passing on to the next generation. I mean, money's great, but, you know, it's really how you live your life and what your children and, and nieces and nephews and friends and family have seen, right? Look at what I do, not at what I say. So it's really powerful as a spiritual practice, and I think as an emotional one as well. Let's talk about your team. So 
One of the most important things when you're creating a state plan, even at the simplest level, is who are the people you're going to ask to serve, right? Um, this is a big deal, particularly in Marin and San Francisco, where we have a lot of senior women, especially, who don't have family in the mind. And so you meet someone, there are two different kinds of people you meet. Sometimes you're lucky enough that you know, one or two people can do everything. They can wear all those hats and all those skills. In other cases, particularly in the healthcare field, you know, they're, so say you've got three kids, okay? And one of them is like my brother, it goes into full panic attack at the doorway of the hospital. You think I'm kidding, I'm not, okay? So you don't want him to be a husband, <laughs> right? You want somebody to go in there, not only uh, stay calm, but who can be a bit of a tiger if necessary. And you're going to know which of the people in your life can fit that. Because that, that's a really, it's a very difficult thing to do. Those of you who have been agents for people at the end of life or in serious illness, you know this. It's nerve-wracking, right? And so part of your job in choosing the right person is also to provide them with the information they need so that they feel like they're doing the best job they can. My mother was so clear about what she wanted. And it's a sad, so everybody has an opinion. You know, and they come into the hospital room and they're like arguing with me, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, yeah, no, I know exactly. We talk about it repeatedly. And if I do what you want me to do, she's like, I want me to do this my life. You don't know my mother. <laughs> right? So how much can you, and that's why I say like the five wishes is great, but it's more about what you're telling your family, about what you want in your environment, who you want in your environment. Do you want poetry? Do you want scripture? Do you want music? So there's a group called the Threshold Choir. Right? So I have, this, I have a client who's an opera singer and a voice coach. And so I said, oh, well, we should put in these instructions about threshold choir. And she, she says, I couldn't bear it. <laughs> I go, oh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> right? I think we're gorgeous, but I'm not a professional singer. Right. Right. But instructions like, um, would you really think of Marin where you have a real variety of spiritual but not religious people? You know, there's importance in ritual, whether it's hosted in a particular faith tradition not for humans. We've been burying people with ceremony for tens of thousands of years, right? It's in our DNA. And so to help people maybe think about that, maybe wipe that out, maybe discuss that with their children, right? And particularly now with you know, what, the environmental thing, like what does a burial look like? What is cremation? What are the environmental you know, ramifications of things like that? So the more you can talk to, your, particularly to your kids if you have children, but talk to your agent. Make sure that they feel like they understand what's important to you, because they're going to get a lot of pressure in the medical setting. There's always someone in every situation I've been in. There's always one medical professional who just isn't willing to honor the, the fact that life is fine. They just can't bear it, right? And they're gonna work that trauma out on your loved one. So, and I'm not saying, believe me, I have 30 year olds come in and say, pull the plug if I have a hang out. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. Right? Because, like I said, when you have a meaning, you can endure it many times. Right? So, make sure you have those conversations. If you have kids, have those conversations with them so you understand their wishes. Right? We don't all die old. Right? We die motorbike accidents. They want on 101 last week. You know? Guys out for a ride. Something falls off the back of a pickup truck. A car slams on the brakes. Another car moves to avoid it. In a second. And I think if anything we've learned in the last 18 months is that we don't know. And we are not in control. So I'm not suggesting any of these will control any of those factors. What I am suggesting is making these plans will make it easier 
for the people in the years online. So, for example, a couple of years ago, I did, went to it was LastPass, one of the passwords. How many of you have problems with passwords? <laughs> right? Every time I sign on to the bank, they want me to change my password. So, and I have a red binder, right? Cross out, cross out, cross out. Okay. So, my son in law, who's I guess 58 now, very smart guy, just we gotta put you, we gotta get the latest password. Now. Okay, great. Right. You select a master password, right? So, I very carefully wrote the master password on the green index card. After looking for it frantically for nine months, because I thought I put it in a book on my bookshelf. Okay, no, no, no. I taped it under my desk. <laughs> Another reason I know this, do not tell my husband, I was eating jelly beans and I dropped one. <laughs> and I will not waste the jelly beans. So I'm like, oh, I'm eating these under my desk. I'm looking for a jelly bean who's a red one, right? And I look up and there it is. So make sure someone has your master password or they know where your list is, right? And especially for financial accounts. If you're doing your banking and your finances online and your person doesn't have access, once the bank knows you're dead, everything's frozen, including for married couples on joint accounts. Okay. It's so yes, no way your passwords are. The other thing I think that's really helpful is to the extent that this is something you're comfortable with, and we did this in a church group, so this was kind of fun. We talked about what uh, what would we like the memorial service to look like? What would we like our obituary to say? Who should be notified? So my mom died at 89. And her address book had fallen into kind of disuse and confusion. So a couple of years before she died, we were, I did her obituary with her. She was very particular about that. And then we did a list of who she could notify. And she did a list of like mementos she wanted to send to people. So she wrote notes to go with the mementos, right? <laughs> that was super helpful to me. Like I knew what she wanted. And for example, my mother was not religious. She, she was vehemently not religious. And so we had a picnic for her, right? But because she died in January, <laughs> and because the weather was so miserable, and so many of the people coming were older, I didn't want people traveling, I didn't want flu, so we waited until May, right? And in May, we had all the mementos boxed up with her notes inside. And you know what touched people? No. I never had. Well, you gotta have kind of a plan for those things. Okay? Other people, our church um, in the city has a special file in the pastor's office as well, generally available. Pastor has it, which is um, music, hymns, readings. You do that here? That's great. It's super helpful because the family is in grief, and it's really helpful for the minister to say, Hey, mom left this, and we start here. Right? Really helpful. Um, the other thing that we did was a, um, we did a workshop that had to do with this was so funny. There are about 50 people from our seniors group, and everyone brought their box full of stuff they never sorted, like they knew they needed to sort the stuff, but box and they had big tables and everyone brought their box and we helped people put together pen are you a binder person or a folder person and we got the basics and I could I had a big shredder company and we could shred everything else. So that can be a really interesting community activity and a way to make people feel less alone. Like Claudia would tell you I will show up if I told someone I'll be there You too, right? But sitting alone at home with a pile of stuff, there's so many other things to do. Did you have, um, it sounds like you've actually done a lot in your community to like begin to address some of these issues, right? You've done the reading group. Do you have another book plan? Um, the issues that came 
out of the reading group are all listed back on the table. Mm -hmm. And one of them is writing down obituary. Mm -hmm. So we're going to plan to have a session on that. So um, if you're interested, um, we need to know if that's of interest to people. So please sign um, with any of you who work. Um, the other issue is whether you want to do your own estate plan, which you can do, which is why the resources are there on the second document, um, or if you want to use an attorney. There are lots of different ways to find attorneys. There's um, the Marin County Bar Association. You go online, they have a member directory, and you can search by practice area. So it'll tell you who's close to you. Then you can check their website, right, to see how they approach it and so on. The other thing is next door, if you put it out there, a lot of your neighbors will have had experiences. Or um, sometimes people look at Google reviews. You have to be careful because the people who tend to write are the people who are dissatisfied. Um, and ask your CPA. Your CPA may know someone, or your financial advisor will probably know someone, right? What do they cost? So estate plans can vary enormously. I'm a, a rare attorney who does this. I post my prices on the website. I feel like people, um, particularly I work with middle class people, and I think this is a big budget item. So I post like how we organize things. We do it as packages, most attorneys do. Um, because most middle class people aren't used to paying hundreds of dollars per hour. For X times hours, right? It's a little overwhelming, but you know what this is. So check to see. You can usually almost look, most attorneys do a free consultation, right? Zoom has been great because you can consult with people and they don't come and get exposed in the office or anything like that. So that's one thing. There's also a lawyer referral panel that's run by the County Bar Association. And they're used to get, I don't know if it still is. There's a county law library in the Civic Center. It's still there. Still there? Because mm -hmm. they moved twice, right? But they're still there. And um, they have a lot of consumer materials, as well as helping lawyers. I mean, they have a consumer a mission as well as professional mission. Did anyone have any particular question about their own experiences or so on? I think. Uh, if we go into that, we can turn it off. If you have a general question, we can get into the work on this now. As you know, I would like to leave for you, but you're not available in my house. So um, I'm not very tech savvy. I, I don't yeah. know how to do this. I mean, that sitting across the table or desk with somebody, how I've done it in the past. Of course, and, and we all did it that way in the past. Um, so one thing that, that I know I did during COVID and many attorneys did is we met with people outdoors once there was a vaccine available, right? So fully vaxxed, outdoors, fresh air, you can do that with some attorneys. For me, it's more a question of capacity because now I've worked until March. And the problem was that during COVID, we had 17 clients die and we had 12 clients lose parents. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of death in practice. That's a lot. And there's a lot to do to protect people and help people transition financially and so on. Um, but there are attorneys. Um, if you, my number, my phone number, my website on the bottom, I think of one of the pages. I forgot how. But if you write me, then I can introduce you to someone okay. who can see you before that. Right. We also did. Um, on the phone <laughs> through the kitchen window. So we could see each other without masks and hear each other, but with the kitchen window with the mask. Right? And then with assisted living on us outdoors, outside people's windows, with the pop up. Right? And it's been really hard, especially for my family clients. They've had to have someone in their family set up Zoom for them. But I have to tell you, and this is true for a number of my colleagues, having Zoom with older clients can manage that gives us a lot more information about their well-being. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I can see their house. Right. I can see just, you know, if they're struggling, they're not going to tell me. I wouldn't know sitting in the office, but I can see, you know, the signs of visit people, you know. But that's been a great plus. Right. 
And I get to make people's balls and cats. Yeah. <laughs> Is there? I might have missed it, but did you review what probate is? Because everybody talks oh. about, you know, how terrible it is. Thank and you. I mean, you could give a side by side, like with a trust or without, you know. Yeah. Okay. So the thing about probate is um, I don't do probate. That's how bad it is. I refer it to other lawyers because it makes me reach. Okay. So probate is a legal procedure where you take something, if you die with a will, you take your will to the court, you file a petition to probate your will. Um, there's a $435 filing fee. It takes right now almost three months to get a hearing. Um, during that time, you have to provide these notices in the newspaper. I think the minimum that I paid in the last five years was $3.50 to publish. And then you have to record with the court, file with the court, the proof that you publish. Um, all this has to happen before the hearing. And at the hearing, provided that the probate examiner didn't find anything wrong with your papers, this is like the IRS times 10, okay? Then the court will grant an order that issues what are called letters testamentary. That's the document that, that empowers the, the executor to take your letters and you go to the bank, right? Or you go to the realtor if you're selling a house. Without that, you are dead in the water. So that, at best, would be two months right now. Um, and the worst of the COVID, it will almost three. Then you have to do an inventory and appraisal of all the assets the person owned at the time of their death, for which you pay the probate referee a percentage of the value as the appraisal will be. The, appraise, the probate referee gives it back to you with the values. You file that with the court. Okay? Then you have to do the notice to creditors. So people who you might owe money on forward because your executor may not know who those people are. There's a period of time in which the creditor can make that claim. Then you pay the creditors, you assemble all the assets, and you go to court and you ask for an um, order of final distribution and accounting, or hopefully a waiver of accounting. Right? A waiver, if you are required to make an accounting, um, you usually need a CPA to do this. It's very formal. You submit it to the court, and again, the probate examiner reviews it. If it's approved, then you can make the order of final distribution. All of those things require a hearing with notice requirements in advance. So right now, I finally, the gentleman I told you about who died in the bottom with the statutory bill, we finished his probate. He died in September of 2019. We finished his probate in May of 2021. To get the final distribution so his sister could distribute to the nieces and nephews. Isn't it better to avoid probate? I vote for that. <laughs> and how do you do that? So let me just say, in terms of probate, the probate is very helpful because someone dies without them, right? That's called intestate. Without a testator, because the person writes the will. So there's a procedure to make sure, for example, that the widow receives and that the children receive, right, in certain proportions. So this is really important in a blended family, right? So if their children by a first marriage, you want to make sure they get their share, that sort of thing. Um, probate in other states is a breeze. It's not a problem. People in Texas are crazy anyway, but they think we're nuts because of the trust and all the complications, but we just don't have the staff or the funding. If you, so you can do an estate that doesn't require probate, okay? Really, unless you own real estate. If you own real estate, it's just too hard. But if you don't, if you have accounts, and if you can name a pay on death beneficiary, those are for cash accounts, or a transfer on death beneficiary, and you keep them up to date, and if none of those people die, then when you die, all they have to do is file claim forms. Okay? So, and there are people that I've helped do this, they just 
who don't want to trust. They're going to stay on top of everything. And I just do a really big letter that says, you said you're going to be responsible for this. But if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Right? I understand. Some people just don't want to go to the trouble. One of the things with, so California in 2016 adopted the transfer of death deed. Makes sense, right? A lot of states allow you to name a beneficiary on your deed. And so if you pass to your beneficiary, you get that. It has been a nightmare. It has been a nightmare. The only two probates I've been involved with in the last four years both involved transfer death deeds that didn't work. Okay. So what happens? They're also sunsetting, so they're not going to be available on the issue anymore. Um, so what happens is when someone dies, then the person who's named on the deed files an affidavit of death with the county, and the county reports the title and the name of the person on the deed. Okay. What happens if one of those, like this lady who did it, this she was just too far gone to do anything else, named her three sons? Okay. Before she died, one of her sons. So we had to probate his share of this deed. So the thing we were trying to avoid, but who knows, right? Who knows? And if you name one person, right, it's not going to go to their children without a problem. So we don't do this. If you own property, you need to trust. You don't have to have a 200 page trust. You can have a 15 page trust. Does a manufacturer own where you don't own the land? You know, that's really, that and floating homes are really an interesting question. Could you repeat the question? Please? Oh, I'm sorry. He asked if a manufactured home where you're leasing the land, the lease, right? Or a floating home. Floating homes have the same two distinctions. So some floating homes and some mobile homes are recorded with the county recorder, just like they were property, like real estate. Others are recorded with the Department of Motor Vehicles. And they have a special division of community housing. Oh my gosh, I'm trying to get title changed on those. Yeah, if the way it gets treated in the probate process, you, you should probably use a trust. Seriously, I know there are several of them in there, like communities where there's a, a land lease underneath it, and it's also complicated to refinance and do things like that because of that relationship. Yeah, so make sure if that if you have an asset like that, be sure and say that during your initial consultation. So the attorney's clue in and thinks about that. Because it's a little technical. Okay. If I want to change my current estate plan, but not go to the lawyer, just have some changes in something, like something that I'm going to give to somebody or how my pets are going to be taken care of. Can I write it out by hand, sign it, and attach it to my original estate plan? Okay. So and you're talking about a will or a trust? I have trust. Okay. So first thing, so wait, wait. Can no, you me, question? Okay. So, so she wants to know if she can amend her trust um, without an attorney and do it in handwriting. So first thing I want to tell you, this is super, super important. Do not write on your original trust. It invalidates it. The court will throw it out. Okay, so don't go in there, correct your daughter's name, she gets married by hand. Do it as a separate document, right? The thing with a trust, you don't have to have it memorized in California, but most everyone does. So it depends. Is there anyone in your life who might object to the change you're making, in which case you want to have it memorized to prove that it was you who did it? If you're changing simple things like making make provisions for my, my dog, um, uh, add my granddaughter. We just got married and she's having a baby. Or uh, I want to leave a specific gift to my friend. Right? You can do those and you can do it by hand. You can do it typewritten. Um, I think if you're going to do it by hand, just to make sure I would have it at least witnessed by two adults. I wouldn't want it to be entirely foregrounded. It can be when you're speaking. I just think it feels safer. Right? If you're going to change a will, it's called a codicil. And what you have to do is make sure. So if you're doing this, you're going to say, I'm changing my trust by name, dated such and such. And you want to say, like, what section you're changing. Like, make it as easy as possible for someone to do it. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Elizabeth, uh, this is all very helpful. It, it could be um, also helpful to talk a little bit more about some of the key provisions in a trust, okay. the trustee's role, how it works with the simple will, and how that avoids probate. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Okay. So, so let's see. So this is your trust property, right? This is, we call them grantors. They might be called settlers. They might be called trustors. They might be called trust makers. It depends on the software the attorney is using. Then we've got the trustee. And then we have the beneficiary, okay? When you create a trust or a couple creates a trust, you're all three of these. So you're making a contract with yourself. Seems silly, right? At some point in life, this person will change. You may be incapacitated, you may be gone. But you name someone to manage this contract on your behalf if you're not available. Okay? Initially, it's for your benefit. If you're a couple, it's going to be for the benefit of the surviving spouse. Ultimately, it's going to be the benefit of your children or other beneficiaries. Okay? But this is your trust stuff. Over here, we have what we call direct transfer assets. And these go by beneficiary form. So this could be life, this could be iris, this could be annuities. In certain circumstances, people do put these assets in an irrevocable trust, a standalone trust, but they've got to be pretty big values to make that cost effective. Five million, usually no, before it's worth it. Okay, so that's all over here. And then, you know, there's just this stuff that happens in life. I have a client that laid in the life. He's back in the days when um, banks gave toasters and blenders if you would open a checking account. Okay, so she went out for Christmas shopping and opened 10 accounts. <laughs> she put $10,000 in each one of these. Not what I would have done, but anyway. Okay, so they're all out here floating around, right? So they're out here. They don't have beneficiaries. Right, so how are we going to move them in there? Right, that's what the four over will is for. That's a that little four page will that says, I have a trust. And there's a legal procedure called a Hexstead petition. And you just file the papers with the court that says, Here's the trust, here's the four over will. We'd like a court order assigning these assets to be handled by the trust. So instead of opening a full probate, you just file a petition, which is usually handled um, without a hearing. It's usually decided on papers, and you'll get a tentative ruling three days before the court. But that's how the pieces work together, right? We were talking about the kind of person that makes a good healthcare agent. It's a different kind of person to serve in these roles or to serve as agent for finance or executor, right? So a pour over will nominates an executor. And then I really is as bad as it looks. Okay. And then you have an agent, a money agent, which is under your power of attorney. So these people here, here, here are your state planning team. And often people will choose someone in these positions who just really well organized, right? I, I did have a client, I went to sign with her and I met, she had her trustees come to see me. Okay. One of them was a woman receiving SSI who wanted me to pay her in cash. The other was a guy who had filed a tax return in 15 years because he thought the government was track. Not good choices. Okay? <laughs> because the trust has to issue a 1099 
to the person they're paying to do this work. Okay, so you need someone that's reliable, reasonably well organized, trustworthy, right? Because they're going to make sure that whatever's in here gets to your people down here. That's for sure. Did that answer the question? Yeah, very helpful. Okay. And the, the whole point about this being a contract is that you can include whatever terms are important to you, right? So, for example, a lot of people uh, who have minor children right, at the first step, right? That's the river. You cross the river, okay? Then everything goes into some sort of trust for the surviving spouse, if there is, right? That's the joint trust and that's the surviving spouse. There's a procedure for creating a bypass trust if you need it. We haven't needed one for quite some time um, because of the high exemption now. This year it's $11.7 million per person. It's set to end uh, 12-31-2025. The Ways and Means Committee just put, in, put out the summary of the reconciliation bill of Congress. It's accelerating that to 12-31-2025. Of course, who knows what actually gets done in Congress, but it's going to make a big difference for people because it's going to go from 11.7 to 6.5. For 99% of the people I work with, this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. I work with double cost people. But for some people, it's a problem, right? Okay. Then we have at the second gap. I always make this is really hard with young couples with little kids because if you're asking them to imagine the worst thing that could happen to a parent is that something would happen to both of them. And someone else is going to raise your children. There are tears. It's just a horrible thing to contemplate. And I get that. But if you make a plan, you've done what you can do. And statistically, it's less than 1% of families where that happens. It's less than 1%. So statistically, it's unlikely. But if it does happen and you have a plan, it's terrible, right? So at the second step, if you have minor children, you can put everything in a common trust, just like you would at home. If you've got kids, you don't go, oh, well, you've got more than options, so that comes out of your share of your parents. And you've got, you know, you've got LA lessons, right? You treat it as a common trust, usually until 25, or when the youngest child graduates from college. Unless there's a big difference in the ages. So I have clients where they have a four and a five-year-old, and they have a 19 year old. So the 19 year old is going to get his outright early, like at 25 or 30, a separate trust, right? And then this will be for the little ones. And then at a certain age, at this point, then you create a separate trust to whatever age you want. And when you've got little kids, you don't know what they're going to be like by age. You don't know what their personalities are going to be like. You don't know how they're going to manage money, what kind of stress they might be subject to. And so you can put this in here. You put them in a little box, right? And it protects them. It can protect them to 30, 35. And one lady kept calling me and changing it as her kids got to 60 and 65. <laughs> you know, sometimes you get a dead hand go. Um, this is really helpful because modern trusts no longer require the trustee to distribute the principal. Why is that important? At a certain age, usually 30 or 35, the beneficiary has the right to withdraw. This is really important. If you have a kid and they're in the middle of a divorce, you don't want them making this money part of the marital estate. That wasn't their intention, right? Or they're in a business conflict. Or they just have buddies that have a great business idea and they know you're wrong and left you some money. Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't get to it. Right? So it's a protection. <laughs> Other people, you got good kids, they're in their 40s, you're just going to leave it for them. But you'll include something for their children in case something happens to them. Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about special needs trust? Yeah, um, a special needs trust. Very general, because I don't do them, I have two colleagues I use. So they're, we usually call them supplemental needs trust now. A special needs is a little pejorative. Um, and the idea is that if you are receiving SSI 
or Medi-Cal benefits, which is super important if there are prescriptions involved or therapies and so on. If you inherit anything in your own name, it, it can exceed the needs-based criteria and you can be disqualified, which your grandparent never intended when they left you $25,000, right? So there are a couple of workarounds now. There's an ABLE account. So the trustee or the executive of the grandparents can make the payment to an ABLE account, which segregates it. Or you can have a trigger in your trust that says if any of these people is incapacitated or is receiving needs based assistance, it will become a supplemental needs trust. Okay, and you've got to do it right, which is why I have people to do it all the time, because it's like it's dealing with the IRS and Social Security at the same time, right? That's what's called a third party supplemental needs trust, because the rules are different. If you create your own special needs trust for yourself, that's called a first party self settled, different rules apply. Did that help? A little bit. I know that. Oh, I know. What do you mean by the third party? So uh, I have a friend whose son was injured in a motorcycle accident, had a head injury. And so they, the judge in the lawsuit that followed, right, for the liability, created a trust for his benefit with the proceeds from the insurance. That was created by a third party, the judge. So that went on this young man who's now 59. He's seven years 21 to receive um, Medi Cal and SSI. It was a blessing. It was a real blessing. This lady. Um, do those, what you just explained there for minor children, is, is it the same for minor grandchildren? It can be. So if you have children, if, so some people, grandparents say, my kids are more successful than we ever were, but I just want to leave it to my grandkids. <laughs> Then you can just cut this out and you can just go directly down to the next generation. I would suggest if you do that, that you tell your kids you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right? And then here's a question okay. if you're leaving it for your grandkids, are you leaving it for all the grandkids equally, which is what people do? Whereas if you leave it to your kids and one kid has three kids and one kid has two kids, then the three kids are going to share half if mom or dad is dead and the two kids are going to share half. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it depends if you think about is it for your kids or for your grandkids? And you can draft it so it says, well, my kids like this, right? But if both kids are done or gone, I want all the grandchildren to be I have an additional question. Mm -hmm. If something happens to you, you mean if you die, yes, what, what happens to all of this the business transactions? So that's how you name your team, right? You have a successor trustee, and they have requirements under the probate code about who they have to notify that you've passed and that there's a trust. So you have to send notices to like your beneficiaries and your heirs. And this is one of those things. Heirs are people related to you by parent-child relationship, bloodline, not collaterals, not nieces and nephews. Initially, descendants, right? And then if you have no children, they go up to your parents, across to your siblings, and down to their children, allowed. So there's a plan. But this is the person. Okay. She's talking about herself. If she herself died, who would step in to make this happen? No, if you don't. If me, the yeah. attorney. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have what's called a practice administrator. So we've had a lot of trouble in California where attorneys have died. And their grandchildren end up with all their files in their garage. Oh, I'm not kidding. I've gone into people's garages to try and find old wills. Um, so I have, it's in my trust and in my power of attorney that I have a special administrator who is a, a, a state planning attorney about 10 years behind me. But that means she's got 20 years of experience, right? And one behind her, and she's appointed by my trust. She has insurance, she's covered by my insurance. Um, if I fall down and knock my head, I have staff, but I want to make sure I have someone from outside the insurance. So if you're working with a solo, ask what their plan is if something happens to them. It's a very good question. Yeah. I have a 
Linda, Linda? would you mind using the microphone so it could be heard? Um, oh. Okay. Ah. Uh, I wanted to uh, re address what you're talking about as far as and um, a special needs trust, because I have you know, time to experience my personal life with this. And um, there's something, and you don't have to have five million dollars, that's for sure. There's something called a family needs trust. So, for example, if you got married late in life and you have more assets than your husband, and your husband is used to all his assets, your assets don't have to go to support. Husband, husband can be in a nursing home, can apply for Medicaid. So it's a really good thing to do for people who've married later in life. Yeah, um, that's Medicaid planning, and uh, there are people that specialize in that. Um, yes, so that's often done so that the surviving spouse isn't impoverished, like here for the you know, the first house to buy. Yeah. And the look back. Yeah. In California, the look back is five years. Three now. Okay, well, that's three nationwide. Then. So what happens is say you're going to be applying for a nursing home in, with Medi-Cal, right? Medi so Medicare does not pay for long-term care. <laughs> does not pay, it pays for 100 days in a nursing home if you're discharged directly from a hospital. Okay, if you're helping someone in the hospital, make sure they have a discharge directly to a rehab or nursing home or Medicare won't cover. It's really a problem. Um, so if you're in long-term care after that 100 days, then it falls to the family to pay for it. If you're indigent and if a, you get to own your house, you get to own a vehicle, and they're kind of increasing the limits, right now it's two thousand dollars in cash. How do you even pay the electric bill? Know, but, um, so in order to prepare to have Medi-Cal pay, families will move assets from their names to the names of their children. And they'll either do it directly or they'll put it in an irrevocable trust so that the creditors of the child can't get the house and of course the widow, all of that sort of thing. Um, there is a look out period. So if you make a transfer like that, you have to live three years. Otherwise, Medicare Social Security is going to come and take that value back to reimburse the government for the cost of the work. Yeah. Again, you want to work with a Medicare specialist to prepare that because if you screw it up, they are right off together. Very good point, though. Medicare planning, special needs trust if you have a grandchild or uh, an adult child or a grandchild who needs special needs, you have to do special planning. And I would never leave that to the probate court. I would always do that by trust. A lot of people have transferred assets out of their estates to their children in the last couple of years because of COVID 19. Right? Um, those are all held in your trust to protect them so that mom isn't out on the street. Exactly. Everyone knows COVID 19. So, COVID 19 allows a person 62 and over to sell property in any county, move to another county, and use the same property tax basis. Okay? And it used to be there were only seven counties that allowed that now everything does. The second page of that proposition, though, um, severely limited the parent-child exclusion. So if you leave your house to your child, um, your child has to live in the house as their primary residence, and you're only excluded on the first million dollars in value. They eliminated entirely the extra million that's available for family cabin or something else. It used to be unlimited for the primary residence, now it's a million dollars. <laughs> and this thing about how you live in it makes it impossible to leave your property to three children. You know, and the board legalizations is the government agency responsible for the rules to all the assessors. And the problem there has to do with how are they interpreting this. So the Assessors or the board of equalization is issuing letters to the assessors almost weekly trying to interpret this and figure out does that mean you have to live in this house forever? Can you move out and rent it? So they're sort of 
you talked about an able account to set up a special needs? How is that done? And you can go into any bank. bank and open it. It's a special account. It's designed to provide supplemental needs. So um, outings, special therapies that aren't covered, things like that. You know, all, like Merrill Lynch has a whole division that does it. Um, your investment bank will know. Yeah. Size and have your kids apply for the loan under Prop 19, and that's clean and done. Here, here, here's the problem. Okay. So, good to repeat the question. Please. Yeah, so she said, Can't you just give it to your kids now, sell it to your kids and for the mommy price with, without Prop 19? The problem is, at least in the current tax code, if you sell property during your lifetime, if you paid a hundred thousand for the property, now it's worth a million dollars. You're going to pay the capital gains tax on $900,000. You'll get a $250,000 exemption as a single person, $500,000 as, as a married couple. The capital gains rate is proposed to go up to 42% under the new law. Okay? That's a huge hit. If you wait until you die, at least under the current law, then your kids get a step up in basis. If it's community property and the first partner dies, you get a step up in basis for a partner, 100%. So if the survivor needs to sell to move closer to family or into fear, that person won't face the same amount of capital Yes, sir. Uh, would you explain a little bit how a trust is a good way? Or legacy giving to a charity or perhaps a congregation. <laughs> so one of the things that we talk about in the planning process is most of us have institutions, religious, educational, charities we work with that we've supported our whole lives. So one of the things that we want to think about is okay, when I'm gone, how do I want to continue support? Particularly if you've been a regular, um, done regular tithing. That's a huge hit in a conversation budget. Um, so you might want to consider it. There are different ways of giving. So in terms of legacy giving, you can do it from within your trust at the top line. You can do what's called a special gift. So you could do a dollar value or a specific asset of 
We had a lady in the city who gave, she was just, no one, she was just one of these beautiful, quiet people. She left a house in Pacific Heights to the church. Mm-hmm. No one, you know, people in the church have been helping her for decades. And she left this house and it was an $8 million wedding dress. It was amazing, right? So that's all at the top. You could also make them, you know, you could do, you know, a percentage for charity, a percentage for family, a percentage for friends. Any way you want to do it. Another way to do it is over here, particularly for deferred benefit, deferred tax. So IRAs, 401ks, you can make gifts out of there and there's no taxes anyway. Right? So you can say, okay, I'm going to provide for my family in here, but I've got this IRA over here with a chunk I'm going to leave back to a charity or a church or an educational institution. That's a very good point. Um, and uh, let me tell you, those gifts make a huge difference. Maybe not to American cancer, right? Because they're so well endowed, but you look down in your local community and you will find groups that do real work on the ground, local congregations with programs that feed people and house people and counsel people. And, you know, a $10,000 gift is huge for a lot of those people. You don't have, it's like when, was it, KQD says, no gift is too small. That's the truth. That's the truth. It can make a huge difference with charities and, and any kind of um, group that you've been part of or cause that you believe in. I have a client who was so upset about what happened in Texas. Not whether you approve of abortion or not. I don't think anyone approves it. Um, but she was very concerned about poor women not having access, even to good Planned Parenthood plan. So that's where they were like, you want to shut down Planned Parenthood. So she went to Planned Parenthood in New York. They gave her the name of a clinic literally across the street from the Texas border in New Mexico. And she sent them $100,000. To be used for transportation and for health. So they would have a night before the procedure and a night after the procedure and then transportation in both directions. And she's funneling it, this clinic is funneling through churches. Right? So imagine what you can do that has a real impact on people's lives. And it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be mega bucks. Right. And again, it's part of what we're trying to judge about ethical will. Right. And one of the things that we express, <laughs> what do we want to express with our money as well as our lives? So I know there's um, an exclusion for amount you can give to family without being taxed or to whomever. And then you can do the rest to charity. And not be taxed at all by right? those gifts. So does a charity have to pay tax on that? Okay, so the question is um, so we don't have a, a state tax in California. We have a federal state tax which attaches currently 11.7, might attach to 6.9. Um, you can leave money within that range to anyone you care to at your death. You can leave gifts during your lifetime at 15000 per person, 30000 if you're a couple to anyone. Right? For you. For you. Mm-hmm. You can leave more than that, but you have to file what's called a gift tax return that just lets the government track how you're using that your attention. But gifts to charity. So some of my clients are right on the border, right? And so they'll leave everything to family and a few charities that they've already been supported. And there'll be a clause that says if there's a potential a state tax liability, my trustee is authorized to give every dollar above that amount to charities to be selected in my trustee's discretion. You think, why would you get the trigger, right, to avoid the state tax? Because the charities don't pay tax on it, the state doesn't pay taxes on it. But if you name specific charities at that level, it's called the residuary, um, all those charities get a complete copy of your trust. And some of the charities, particularly the big national ones, can be a complete pain in the patootie to your trustee. They want to know everything they spent. They want to know is this in fact their share, right? Smaller charities don't do that. Um, so what we usually do is the trustee and the person 
we may be a gift, have a discussion, and the trustee makes minutes. Preserves your privacy. But, but you're not going to choose someone who's a trustee that you don't trust, right? This is a trustworthy person. If they're going to steal you one, you got bigger problems than this. Could you speak to the victim or lack of other activity trust in case? Yeah. And can you repeat the question? So she's asking about aid and trust. So if, if you have a trust done in the 90s, aid and not even towards the parents do. It used to be there's a joint trust. At the first step, two, sometimes three, right? So we have A, B, and sometimes we have C, and you'll love this. This is the below ground trust. This is the dead person, below ground, okay? And this is an irrevocable trust that holds their exemption amount. So in the old days, it used to be like 300,000 per person or 650, and then it got to a million, right? And this, from hell or high water, goes to your children. No one can change this trust without going to a lot of trouble, okay? That's your bypass trust, that's your below ground trust for the dead person, okay? This is the above ground trust. This is the surviving spouse. The surviving spouse gets everything that's more than whatever this amount was. In those days, it's like a million. So maybe there was two million and they would go over here. Or could go over here. Right? So this is a completely revocable trust because you don't want your spouse tied up. Right? This is what we call the I love you trust. Right? This is the spouse's property and her or his half of the deceased spouse's property. Or whatever that order is, this can be changed any way they want. So, you know, you can always have a spouse who falls over the sway of a pawn person. We call it the cool girl, cool boy problem. Uh -huh. And suddenly your children are out in the wilderness. <laughs> so, it's that, that trade off between control and flexibility. This is absolutely control, but you have a capital gains problem. Okay? This one, you get a step up the basis of the second death, wipes out capital gains, but you've got this wandering craziness, right? So that's the whole AD trust. They used to be required, I mean, just as a matter of planning, when the exemption amount was so much lower than it is now. Now we have something called portability. You've seen this or read anything. So portability says that the surviving spouse can file a, an estate tax return that has the effect of saving the exemption amount. You're just telling the government, my husband has died, the exemption amount was $10 million, he has five, we have a 10 million dollar, he has five, I want to save that extra five for myself, okay? So this is why we're going to probably go back to this because the government is looking to lower the exemption amount because dead people don't vote. No. Right, so it's an easy, low-hanging fruit to increase tax revenues mm -hmm. right? at the second death. But this is that's the B trust, A B, and then the C is a different. This one is um, usually uh, the surviving trust. Uh, so the survivor has full control over it, um, and it may or may not be um, stepped up the basis. There's a technical thing about that. So this is the way it goes for years and years and years, right? Here's one of the problems. If you had a house, right, you put half of it here and half of it here, which was customarily done, you can't refinance this. You can't get a reverse mortgage on the portion of the house here. So title companies can't do it. So now we always need the house to the survivor. Just so the survivor has as much flexibility as he or she might need, to reverse mortgage or to sell in order to pay for care. Right? Because we don't know. Often there's 20 years time. My mother lived 25 years after my grandma. Right? So, is there anything else I can help with? I'm going to stick around for a little while.
I hope um, if you have a personal question, please let me know. So this is the capital gains. You said 20 to 42 percent. It's in the proposal. Happen? Right now it's 35. Okay. So when is that? Okay. Well, here's what's interesting. The ways and means um, summary says that they're going to hold a vote on November 27th. I mean, September 27th. I'm like, they can't find their way to the bathroom in that. No, all the Apple things. Your is yes. After March, after March. And when would it take effect? Immediately. Well, there are different versions of this bill, so one of them had this weird September thirteenth date on it. Now why? But most people think it's going to be the end of this year. Now they have the power. They did this before. They can make it retroactive to January one of this year. So people don't have any time to make any changes. So who knows? I mean, we keep, I'm in the study group, we keep looking at these bills because the first bill was to switch to a UK Canada system, which has capital gains at death. So you, your family, have, your estate has to pay capital gains on the assets at your death on a house step over basis. But that's a huge sea change. They didn't solve that. I think they did that to terrify the <laughs> Yeah, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.